Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, this is a recording that is intended to capture what a few of us did um, at AWS, CrowdStrike, Okta, Zscaler, and Splunk, what we accomplished on a Snowball Edge device and were able to demonstrate at DC Summit on June 7th and 8th of this year, 2023. It is, just to level set with everyone, not a comprehensive demo that shows our final end result, but an iterative first phase. First phase, and for those who were not able to attend Summit or capture or capture one of our demo presentations at that time, this is for you. We call this zero trust at the edge, and just for a bit of background, all of us got together. And again, it's AWS, CrowdStrike, Okta. Splunk and Zscaler to talk about what we could do in combination as a set of partners, um, many of whom have best of breed capabilities in the zero trust space. What could we do end to end for our customers and especially solving some of those hard cases that we hear about? And our goal is to take a, a smaller slice of zero trust and show it in a, in a way that can be uh, incremental and iterative, as so many zero trust implementations need to be, and also, again, address a need that's out there and a little harder to address, which is the tactical edge. So we're going to talk about how together we have partnered to develop the beginnings of zero trust solutions at the edge. And with me today, we have Rich Johnson, Senior Sales Engineer for Federal at Zscaler, John Amorosi, the Federal CTO at CrowdStrike, and Vivian Richards, Partner Technical Manager for Public Sector at Splunk. When we were considering our audience um, for Zero Trust at the Edge, we wanted to think about who is going to need it and under what reason, under what uh, circumstances. What are some of the reasons for this Zero Trust architecture um, in the real world? We have a couple of personas that we focused on for that. One, of course, being the tactical user. And we mentioned tactical user here because it could be a soldier, but it might also be a civilian. This is a use case that applies both to the military and to some of our federal agencies in the civilian space. You can think of FEMA as an example. And this user would be one who does need elevated privileges uh, for more sensitive applications out in the field. So we've got here, um, RDP and SSH is an example of some of those more critical or sensitive applications. And we have an application that would be shared more broadly with perhaps less sensitivity in a WordPress app. We also have a mission partner, a representative of a third party who's only come uh, together on this project for specific, a specific reason. It might be a training mission, for instance. And this individual needs some access, but not all. Um, not all of the applications are relevant to their job duties. WordPress is the example that we, again, have chosen for more broad use, and RDP and SSH are representative of those more critical, sensitive applications that the mission partner would not have access to. And we bring in the Snowball Edge for that ruggedized um, computing capability out in the field. Uh, this is a device that does operate in more austere environments and can, can handle more shock um, in a compact format weighing just, um, I would say, under 49 pounds. The snowball that we have, I think, clocks in at 41 pounds. We chose, too, the higher end of the vCPU that we could. We went with 104, so we could max out some of our, our um, partner's capabilities with that kind of computing power. And again, if um, you're able to catch us live at any events that we might attend after DC Summit, please do come by and check it out. It is a pretty neat device and very portable. The demo it, um, architecture itself consists of a couple of workloads um, on the Snowball. And Zscaler's app connector is critical to the prevention of any lateral movement between those workloads. The service edge that is also on the Snowball is helping to administer and enforce the policies that we have written um, that, again, are very precise, um, precisely aligned with the personas that we mentioned just a bit ago. 
We have a log connector feeding data from Zscaler to Splunk, and we have more integrations for the applications um, and um, inputs from CrowdStrike 2 also going to Splunk on the Snowball Edge. And of course, we'll talk more about this in detail. We have an active directory uh, also local to the Snowball and moving out from this device and over to some of our endpoints, we're working with a couple of laptops that again are uh, assigned to those two personas, either the tactical user or the mission partner. And as they request access to the applications that we described before, coming through that service edge and onto App Connector, all of their activity is being logged and sent to Splunk. Authentication is happening with Okta as the uh, single source of truth. Um, our, that's our primary um, directory for identity. And it will push a, a new users that have been onboarded onto the local AD. And should there be a disconnected use case where changes are made to AD, those would be pushed back to Okta whenever the snowball is returned to its base and has um, online connectivity again. Our demo use cases, we have, as mentioned before, the partner access that we would expect to see with authentication to Okta, and then Zscaler helping to grant access to the WordPress app, but block the access to RDP or SSH as you might expect. And this, of course, assumes that there is a posture compliant device being used by the mission partner. In the second use case, we have a tactical user, again, demonstrating this least privilege access with authentication through Okta and Zscaler, again, granting access to WordPress and RDP and SSH because that is what matches the user's profile and their, um, they've checked that posture compliant device as well. We have local AD in here for um, further enforcement and we'll, local AD would play more of a role in the disrupted scenario, which we'll get to very soon. If the device is non-compliant and its posture does not pass um, Zscaler's thresholds or its need for verification from an agent on that device, um, then those apps are blocked by policy and the user, even if it is the tactical user um, who normally would have more elevated access, um, those grants are denied. And I mentioned here too that this can be dynamic and we're gonna build upon this scenario where threat detection can um, change this access in real time. Partner access in a disrupted connectivity situation. This is one where we're using the cache credentials from the prior Okta authentication to maintain access to WordPress and new access requests that would go through Active Directory locally will also pass through Zscaler's private service edge and those will be denied as expected. That would be blocked whether you are in that disrupted environment or you are in the fully connected environment because that is what you would expect for that mission partner. And again, a posture compliant device is assumed here. In a tactical user disrupted connectivity situation, this again is the user you'd expect to have access to RDP and SSH, and they do. Uh, the credentials persist uh, from WordPress and they are, um, and Zscaler will continue to grant access to RDP and SSH through that private service edge on the Snowball. Partner product depictions, we'll move into now with a bit more of a, an in-depth look at how Zscaler achieves what we just saw through its policy enforcement points on the earlier slides. Rich, take it away. Thanks, Kai. So as mentioned, Zscaler is providing the zero trust network access for these particular uh, use cases. So in this environment, uh, as you look to the left, what you see is various different types of personas based upon their identity and their device posture and their risk scoring have access to specific applications that they've been granted access to. The arrows in this uh, illustration are very significant in that you see that everything is being connected to the Zscaler Zero Trust Exchange. So all of these connections are formed by a outbound 
TLS uh, connection that is both visually authenticated and certificate pinned, preventing any session hijacking or men in the middle types of attacks. So everything is connecting to the Zscaler ex uh, Zero Trust Exchange. And then based upon policy that the administrator creates, you can grant access to users in a way that complies with that least privileged access mode of operation. So finance, for example, has connections to the payroll applications, but not to the engineering applications. Maybe a contractor or a mission partner has act, access to certain donor apps, but not to other things such as facilities or you know, engineering or finance. Uh, the important question always comes up, well, what about people that are on-prem accessing something that's also on-prem? Or in our case, something that's on a snowball and you're in a tactical environment and you have users that are in that space as well. In that use case, Zscaler extends their cloud down to the on-premise location by the means of a private service edge. So we have public service edges doing that brokering in our public cloud that's impact level five authorized, but we also can extend that down to, in this case, a snowball. So we have a private service edge on that snowball so that users that are on that in that environment are able to connect directly to applications being hosted on that snowball without having to have their traffic trombone or hairpin back up to our public uh, cloud infrastructure and then back again. This provides the best experience for the end user. They're always gonna have the, and choose the most expeditious uh, form of communication between wherever they might be and wherever their applications might be. And this also gives us the ability to operate even when we lose connectivity to the cloud. So some of the big key takeaways in that is since these, all these connections are outbound, there are no active listeners in the data center or even on the snowball uh, for any outbound you know, connectivity. So this means that your data center in essence goes dark uh, to the outside world. No one can see what your what applications are being hosted or who's connecting to what. All they see is outbound connections to the Zscaler cloud. Uh, and in that sense, they are just simply one of the 40 million concurrent active connections to our cloud at any point in time. So in, in many ways, it's like hiding in plain sight. Uh, so this creates number one, ob obscurity in terms of uh, an obfuscation as to what's being hosted. And also it, it eliminates the attack surface because you can attack what you can't see without any active listeners at the edge of those data centers, there's nothing for anyone else to attack. So it provides higher security, uh, provides uh, you know, your ability for obfuscation. It also eliminates any lateral uh, movement since the users are connected to an application and not to a network on the back end. Uh, a engineer, for example, is connecting to those test and dev servers, has no visibility or ability to reach the payroll or facilities or the other apps that are listed there only those apps that they've been authorized for by policy. Uh, back to you, Sky. Actually, Rich, I think we've got some more here. Ah, I will take this one back, thanks. Um, here's an example of the policy that was used to enforce the blocked access to all the applications upon failure of the ZTA score. This check does not um, include the necessary information, um, does not meet the threshold that's been predefined, and then there is no further movement. And that is um, one of the policies that we have implemented. Another one actually plays a little bit with what that ZTA score will be. The low ZTA score threshold that we chose was 25. And with um, a device that registers a score that is below the 25, there will be no access to the WordPress app, but any scores that are above 25 will grant that access. Well, they will, uh, they will pass this mark. And just as a, as a note, a score of zero is very bad and a score of 100 is what you're going for. And again, you can see here that this is just one of multiple attributes that, is, that are being consumed by the private service edge to enforce the policy. Again, in this instance, we've got um, the skim attributes, from, uh, SAML attributes from Okta, and we also have the high ZTA score from CrowdStrike. The threshold chosen here was 75. And I believe on um, this particular device, it was like around an 88. So again, this is the, the soldier or tactical user's device, and it, 
this user will now have access to SSH. And the same scenario also applied to RDP. And on this screen, or seeing how there's movement from what Rich was just describing as the public service edge, when you see the USFL 8819, this would have been um, one of the service edges in Miami, Florida, and then moving over to the Snowball. So what was once a public service edge is now very much a private service edge on the Snowball itself. And this is what enables those disconnected operations and maintain that the zero trust capabilities on the local device itself. As mentioned before, we used Okta for identity management. And the way in which we did that uh, for this particular scenario and at this time was to create a user in Okta and push that user to Active Directory. Again, we're assuming the scenario is pre-deployment. And in this time you can see we are starting the creation of this user in Okta, but there is no domain admin um, in AD on the Snowball. But we can manage, again, that group of mem membership and provisioning in Okta. And when we do so, we'll assign this domain admin to the Akash domain admin group. And that will uh, appear in, in AD on the Snowball very quickly. Again, if we make changes to this uh, membership or to any of the um, users or groups in AD locally, when we are disconnected again, as mentioned before, we can push that back to Okta when we are reconnected. Now we'll talk a bit about CrowdStrike Zero Trust Assessment Score. John, I'll give this over to you. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, as highlighted throughout today's presentation uh, thus far, uh, one of the core capabilities as part of our endpoint detection and response technology uh, is the concept of a, a zero trust assessment score, uh, which has been part of the various use cases we've been defining uh, with respect to authentication, uh, as well as accessing uh, the environment on the Snowball Edge. Uh, this particular capability serves as a tool to aid customers in assessing their endpoints against the minimum set of device configuration settings uh, in conjunction with our Falcon sensor to secure their devices uh, by establishing a baseline, uh, determine what a healthy endpoint in that particular enterprise uh, looks like. And next slide, please. Now, the first step uh, after our sensor is deployed is to collect telemetry and various signals from the endpoints and gather data on how the operating system as well as the Falcon sensor uh, is configured. Uh, this information is then aggregated together uh, to compute a score uh, ranging from 1 to 100. Uh, a higher number indicates a more comprehensive score, uh, which indicates the, uh, the minimum uh, set of baseline standards uh, has been configured. Uh, we also provide a dashboard, uh, to pro which provides a visual interface uh, that can guide security personnel to review potential areas for improvement and take action as appropriate, uh, thereby increasing the organization organization's overall posture and have a quantifiable metric uh, with, with which to measure against and determine if the overall uh, posture score in that organization is improving. Uh, lastly, one of the cornerstones of the CrowdStrike platform is to allow our customers to leverage their data uh, via our APIs and be as extensible as possible uh, for use with other solutions. Uh, as part of the uh, collaboration amongst the various different uh, solutions as part of these use cases, uh, our uh, zero trust assessment score can be leveraged uh, both by Okta as well as Zscaler uh, to attest to that particular health um, and make policy decisions uh, to ensure that only uh, approved devices uh, that are under management are allowed access to sensitive trusted resources um, versus, as opposed to uh, those that do not. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a screenshot uh, from the project uh, console uh, with two endpoint devices uh, that were enrolled for demonstration purposes. Uh, one fully configured device uh, down below has an overall score of 89, uh, which is indicative of a, of a healthy score, uh, and another which has a, a lower score uh, of 37. Uh, selecting the individual endpoints uh, will give you a readout of which particular uh, settings um, are, are not configured or disabled. Uh, which may indicate that potentially uh, either a misconfiguration uh, or uh, indication of a, an attack uh, against the, the individual hosts uh, that would uh, require further investigation. Thank you, Sky. Back to you.
Thank you, John. Uh, only thing I might add has to do with the um, assessments. And John, please keep me honest here. But one thing I remember from being in this console is just how much you can use to measure the health of this device. And what I, what, uh, I know we're showing under the failing assessments is just a, a snippet of what's possible in terms of the um, criteria for device health. Absolutely. There's multiple different metrics that you can use from multiple different operating systems uh, to gauge whether or not the, the overall health and, and baseline meets, meets those standards, uh, as well as indicate where, where you, you might be able to improve uh, the overall security posture. Very good. Thank you. And next was visibility. Um, just hitting another classic zero trust pillar and tying it all together is what we did with Splunk. And Vivian, I'm going to hand this over to you now to walk through some of the dashboards that were customized for this demo. Excellent. Thank you, Sky. Um, so the first dashboard that we see here on this slide, um, this is the um, only customized asset essentially created for this demo. That means that all of the um, applications and add-ons that are uh, installed in the Splunk instance are currently available at Splunk on Splunk Base for free for all of the users. Um, but we did want to create a custom dashboard that brought, brought in all of the different uh, partners together in one space to give you a quick once-over look at uh, your Splunk um, ingest and the activity that the partners are able to bring into uh, the Splunk dashboard. So really quickly orienting you to this, this slide represents the first, the top portion of the, the full dashboard. Um, at the, the top, you see the hyperlinks of identity investigations and authentication overview um, and on. Those uh, hyperlinks go into our Splunk InfoSec application, which is considered our crawl uh, security deployment application. Essentially, as you're readying for a, a full deployment on a SIM like our Splunk Enterprise Security. Maybe you start with the InfoSec app because that's where you begin um, accelerating some of the data models and being able to bring in um, large data sets and see those um, important data summaries on uh, dashboards. As we move down, uh, you continue to see, you know, designations of, of which clouds, of course, that we are, um, of which data we have in the Splunk deployment, which is exclusively AWS in this demo. Um, and then on and on, um, as we scroll down, you see uh, CrowdStrike's, uh, a couple of panels related to CrowdStrike Falcon and uh, its deployment in the environment. And then um, the final panel in this first top portion is uh, a couple of panels reflecting uh, Okta usage inside of our deployment. Next slide. Okay, and as we continue down to that bottom half of the uh, custom dashboard was really where we zoomed into Zscaler's user policies and responses. Um, and this gave us a really clean way to take a look at the um, activity of our two personas and to very quickly graphically represent um, which uh, applications each of the users had access to or were able to um, gain access to through um, having the appropriate policies in place and the appropriate uh, zero trust risk score. And lastly, the very, the very bottom just simply highlights um, all of the zero trust policy failures. And again, um, those are hyperlinked. So um, just clicking on them can take you to the complete search where you can see all of the failure events. Okay, so this begins uh, the portion of kind of clicking through some of those hyperlinks um, that I referenced earlier. And if you look in the top right of the graphic, you see uh, InfoSec MultiCloud. That is that reference to that intro application that um, we were discussing. And so very quickly, again, we can begin to extract um, the users, some of their activity, all of their authentication attempts, anything that our uh, data models would consider a brute force attack, which of course would be a number of attempted logins over a specific amount of time. And once that threshold was exceeded, it would count as a brute force um, attack. And then um, again, any users that were failing a 
authorization over 80% or whatever percentage we wanted to set that panel at. Um, you see that across the top. Ongoing, you begin to see a source, source user. The reason I want to highlight those is because that has, is an indicator that the data that is coming from all of our partners is being put into Splunk's common information model so that those fields, um, Splunk will look for specific fields or the alignment with certain specific fields to accelerate the data models that are um, associated with those. So in this view, this um, this view really highlights the authentication uh, data model and being able to get, uh, you know, radically summarized uh, event, uh, summarized visualizations over large data sets. Okay, um, and the last portion of this, uh, this dashboard, you see the geographically improbable access. Again, that's part of, you know, anomaly detection that comes out of the box with Splunk. So it's essentially saying, hey, this user signed on here and is now trying to sign on, um, you know, maybe a, a different continent within minutes. So that would trigger um, an access anomaly by geographic improbability. Okay, so again, continuing um, to look into our authentications. Again, similarly, this is part of the authentication data model being accelerated. Um, and so now what we'll see instead of just the anomalous access behavior is just a quick summary of all the different authentications that have happened across our environment. So we can see failed authentications, successful auth authentications, a quick count of which applications we're able to see the um, authentication activity for, and the number of users um, whose authentication activity we are tracking. And so when you begin to have really robust um, graphics, like for instance, the access over time by app, um, that is a, a, you know, a good sign that those data models have been accelerated and you're getting that summar summarized data that you can begin pulling into dashboard panels um, to really, really give you um, a quick visualization of some, some um, large data across multiple applications. Okay, I think we can keep going. All right, and so again, with the authentication um, data model being accelerated, you're also able to map out some of the authentication um, practices either by user and or by source IP or destination IP. Um, and that way you can begin to really quickly map out um, user to device and potentially see any patterns or any patterns of concern of um, a potential, potentially, you know, users um, ex exploiting their authentication privileges, right? Um, okay, and I think we can keep going there. Thank you, Vivian. <laughs> Appreciate the breakdown. Okay, so what's next? After we've done this, and as mentioned before, this is just the first phase of something that is going to continue and develop, what is next? Expanding those capabilities. Um, we were just looking at some of the Splunk dashboards and there's more to come. As Vivian mentioned, that was the beginnings of what you can do with a SIM and we want to automate some actions with Splunk SOAR, which would then change policies on the Zscaler side and those could involve more of the inputs from CrowdStrike, more of the anomaly and threat detections. So each of um, each of the partners in this whole endeavor has more to offer, more to deliver, and that's what we're going to do in the upcoming phases. But to do them in a way, to build out in a way that actually meets users' needs, we need your use cases. So please feel free to reach out with to us. Um, We've uh, met some folks at DC Summit and have continued some of those conversations, but we're open to more. So as you review what we've done, um, please let us know how it could be improved to suit what you need. And if there is an opportunity for a proof of concept, because again, we're designing for real world usage and the more involved we are with you, the better it's going to suit those purposes. So thank you very much um, for your attention and for uh, following this recording and for your interest in our demo as we continue to work with it.